Hey guys, welcome back. This is Resistance Chicks. I'm here with a new awesome friend, Rick Crump from Kinetic Faith. And we had a conversation the other day, one of our um, dear mutual friends, John Diamond, who works with... Um, John Diamond? The, the uh, awesome uh, Alan Keyes, you guys know him, um, with Let's Talk America. But we were talking about the founding of this nation and how far we've kind of gotten from being active in our communities with our faith and then what do you do once you get on the school board? What do you do when you're going before your school board? What do you do um, when you, let's say you are a congressperson and you're, you're constantly being bombarded from the outside? And so, Rick, why don't you tell our viewers a little bit about Kinetic Faith and what spurred you on to start this amazing ministry that's uh, equipping people um, to stand up and to be able to make those cases that need to be made again maybe it's mass maybe it's crt yeah. uh, but you have to be able to add you're equipping people to make those cases and convince their community um rationally and it's just an amazing ministry that you have yeah thank you so apologetics is the core of everything we do um so thank you first of all it's great yeah. to meet with you yeah. it's great to be yeah. in the show it's, it's thank you john diamond for introducing Yay, us as john. always and uh alan keys look forward to i'm going to be on alan's show on thursday oh, so it's we look forward check to check that uh, out let's talk america i'm yeah. brighty on brighty on on uh, thursday afternoon at two o'clock so uh thank you and i think i'd like to start by saying let's define a couple things one that we use this word interposition and yeah. interposition is a, a doctrinal term that basically the the, the layman's term is stand in the gap is equal stand in the gap. Right? I look for a person to stand in the gap, I and I could one. find none, and so I yeah. poured out my wrath. And what I like to point out to people is, is that whenever God's wrath comes on a society, it's because his church isn't doing what they're supposed mm. to do. Okay, like yeah. it's, 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 it's easy to see that society is going to be sinful and godless, but we're supposed to be salt and light. And so we always tell yeah. people that salt and light is an influential role. It's not an, you're not imposing it. You're not, we're always accused as Christians of imposing our will on others, right. imposing our beliefs. Nope. What makes the left nervous, the secular left nervous about us, is that we're not imposing. We just have a very convincing argument. Absolutely. And That's why there's all the censorship is because when you can exactly sit down and right. rationally say a boy is a boy and his girl uh, is a girl, we're at a whole new level of interposition, aren't we? <laughs> well, we, I was just having a conversation with somebody yesterday about the whole my body, my choice for abortion. And I simply looked at the person and I said, what if the baby wasn't her body? would you change your mind? Yeah. And just simply pu pu putting them in that position where they have to like, oh, what if? Yeah. And they don't want to admit that to themselves, yeah. right? But apologetics are, are the power of, and, and how Christ wanted us to be salt and light in this earth. So salt is preserves and light chases away darkness. And I always ask people, so how are we doing? How are we you know, doing? If, we're, if we're being honest it's about God's church, we're not doing a very good job of preserving and, chase, and, and exposing and chasing away darkness. Right. The other thing I like to point out to people is when, there's always the, oh, well, there's the gospel, there's the Great Commission. Rick, this is, this is a distraction to the gospel. And I said, oh, well, that, yeah. That, it's funny you say that because when I look at Matthew 28, that when, when Christ says, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you yeah. as far as disciples, that Greek word means to preserve. So you're going back to preserve again, right? And so huh. he's basically saying not just to obey what I've commanded you, to but preach. to make sure that you keep it intact for others. Wow. And so we have a responsibility as we make disciples to, number one, do it influentially. Yeah. Number two, to preserve and through this advocacy. And we're accused of all kinds of things. Unfortunately, a lot of accusations come inside the church because they're uncomfortable with our role because we're basically telling people, you know, that whole take up your cross thing. Jesus yeah. was serious about that. Yeah. That wasn't some metaphorical, uh, hey, you're going to suffer because people aren't going to like you. Yeah. No, you're going to interpose on people's behalf and you're going to be persecuted for that. Yeah. And that's, we've, we've lost sight of that. So I want to draw a couple of things just to clarify. When you, when you think about the gospel, the way the church defines it today, there's typically two circles, the, ben, the classic Venn diagram. There's intercession, that's praying for others, and there's evangelism. Yeah. And okay. most people would say that's the scope of the gospel. We're supposed to pray for you, we're supposed to tell you you need Jesus, and that's it. That's it. And we say, no, there's a third ring here. Yes. It's not that this is incorrect, it's incomplete. The, the third ring there it is. is interposition. And some real classic examples, well, take Christ himself. Christ, we, we talk about Christ's death and resurrection and what he paid for our sins. But what we ignore is the three and a half years that Christ walked this earth, yeah. he spent confronting corruption, mm. confronting the government. People say, oh, Christ didn't get involved in politics. Christ was constantly involved. Politics is nothing more 
than the adjudication of power. It's how human beings make decisions about power and people vote their values. So you can't separate religion and politics because people vote their values and they get their values from religion. I'm going to stop you right there because you use the word adjudication and many of us had never heard that word oh, okay. until until the election. Yeah. And what they were doing was that a mail in ballot would come in or a ballot would scan and, you adjudicate and it, it and it would and they would look at it and they would and they would they would decide what you were uh, attempting to vote. They made a judgment. And they made a Could a you explain judgment. the word adjudication? So adjudication, judge is in the middle of that word. To adjudicate is to make a judgment about something. So sometimes an insurance company ah. will make, adjudicate your case for a claim, a life insurance is claim. Is that the same word as a adjustment or is that like when you it's it's similar to that correct okay. so they're, it's, they're making an adjudication okay. an adjudication uh, uh is essentially a, a judgment, judgment call, call. exactly okay. exactly and you were using that in reference to what so when people say we shouldn't be involved in politics i say politics is nothing oh. more than the adjudication of power an election is deciding who will have power and when and when you go to vote Following what this. what what basically governs your vote what do you? What makes you decide who to vote for? Your moral values. Who? Who? What? What aligns with your values? Yeah. So I think the economy should be run this way. I think, uh, you know, we should have these liberties and freedoms. I think we should control people this way. It's all about your values, and your values come from your religion. So it doesn't matter if it's Christianity. It doesn't matter if it's scientism. Yeah. You know, science rules all. It doesn't matter if it's environmentalism. It doesn't matter if it's is, like, climatism. Yeah. These are all religions. Yeah. Because religion governs man's thoughts and minds and right. his actions, right? Mm -hmm. So you can't. I tell people. It's just a matter of which religion is going to govern your society, not, not whether religion governs right, your society. Right, right. Now, to be clear again, we're not here to impose. Right. I tell people all the time when we're, our teams say, oh, you know, Leia, what's the point? It's, it's all lost. We're, you know, it's too far gone. Heard I go, that. I say, I say, well, that's funny because last time I checked, they were still suppressing your message. Well, I know. That's why I'm saying it. Well, last time I checked, right. they wouldn't let you allow you to speak. That's what I mean. And the, they're thinking that these are the very reasons why there's not hope. And I go... But if there was no hope and they won, they wouldn't care what you said. They wouldn't care where you said it. And they would basically laugh at you as you said it. Yeah. The fact that they're suppressing you and preventing you from saying it means that you still have the potential to win. And yeah. they're trying to prevent you from doing so. So why are we sitting here and debating it when we should be out there advocating it? Wow, that's so good. You know, um, you are working with John Diamond and Alan Keyes on... Uh, uh, some something really neat, and um, I'll give you a little teaser. It's going to help pastors and ministers and those of us who are Christians to begin to take on those arguments. Correct. That tell pastors just what do you do when a pastor says, "You know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to preach the gospel. I'm just I'm going to stay yep. out of politics. I'm just going to preach the gospel." And you know you've heard it. I've heard it. Yep. So many times. So we, we love, I, I always tell people, there's only two kinds of questions I like. Stupid questions and hard questions. Ooh, okay. And there's only two kinds of, uh, you know, the, 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 the best kind of uh, objection I get is the one that's the most common. Because you, those are basically what we call platitudes. Okay. So a platitude is a spiritual statement meant to get you to accept a lower standard. A platitude, I need to be like writing this, not yeah, taking right. notes. So a platitude is a spiritual statement. Get meant you to, to get you to accept a lower standard. A lower for, standard. For instance, can I give you some examples? Yes. Leah, we shouldn't be involved in this. God is in control. So what they're really saying is that as you see the chaos happening around you, Leah, as you see the uncomfortableness of having to get involved, don't worry, God's got this. We can sit down. And if it goes bad, that's on God, not us, Leah. And that's his plan. Uh, and it's his plan, exactly. The other, another one is, well, all in God's timing. Yeah. Well, basically, it didn't work out. Yeah. And so it must be not God's timing. It can't yeah. possibly be right, 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 that right, you right. didn't do the responsible thing and work hard enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It can't possibly be that we didn't obey Christ and, and interpose. It's, it's obviously God's fault again. Right. So we keep blaming God for these things, quite frankly. Poor God. Yeah, no, I get it. Right? Yeah. And well, we're actually doing something worse. So, man, we're getting into a bunch of theolo theology here, but taking God's name and blaspheming God's name are two sides of the same coin exactly what happens is in taking god's name if you look at the hebrew it means to carry god's name we often uh, think that it's say say word say god's like name a curse flippantly. word yeah right a curse word what it actually the, the most clear-cut example i can give is isis when you go do actions of evil in the name of god that is taking god's name in vain bingo okay yeah so think about this we feel good about ourselves we tend to spiritualize everything 
But when we actually are suppressing the right thing in God's name, yeah, are we not taking his name taking in vain? Taking his name in vain, yeah. Okay? So we tell people, be careful what you're saying here because you're you're literally associating God with his evil. Now, yeah. remember what, when, the, when the Pharisee said that he casts out demons in the name of Beelzebub, and he said, that's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Right. Well, that's the other side of the coin, which is if, if, if uh, taking his name in vain is basically justifying evil in God's name, blasphemy is basically saying that God is the cause of evil. No, I totally get it. I totally get it. And so we do it all the time. So you're talking to pastors, and the pastors are just like, you know what, so they're they're get invo- out of politics, taking, it's too dirty, we're just going to preach the gospel. That's right. So we love Boom. all the objections because we like to show, for instance, that this is the gospel. So let's take on your definition of the gospel. And this means... Stand in the gap. Stand in the gap. So stand, stand in, the gap in the gap is part of the gospel. This is the Standing definition of the gospel. Standing in the gap. That's right. Being the watchman, right? That's right. Being watchman on the wall. And and really it means, our, our cornerstone verse is Hebrews 12, 4. Ooh. So in Hebrews 11, you've got the great champions of faith that yes. all died. And we love to thumbs up and we love to say, yeah. And we love to say, oh, aren't they awesome? But we don't understand how much controversy they were going through when they were standing in the gap. They were sawn in half. They were living in caves. They were they were despised by their own people. Yeah. And guess who hated them? It was their own people. Yeah. Right. Jesus Christ said, "The prophet is not without honor except in his own hometown." Right. Right. right? right. And so we have to understand that these people standing in the gap are going to be at the time they're doing it. Mm-hmm. We're going to hate them for it, but we're going to look back and champion them as as heroes. Right. It's yeah. human tendency. So then you fast forward to Hebrews twelve one through three and basically saying, "Let us run our race now." Jesus Christ in Hebrews 12, 2 is the latest example of interposition who died for us. And then at Hebrews 12, 3 basically says, so you will not grow weary doing the same. And then Hebrews 12, 4 says, for you have not yet begun to shed your blood in your striving against sin. Wow, wow. And I say to people, when you think about what the church talks about striving against sin today, what are the sins that the church talks about striving against? Mm, Don't lie. No homosexuality. Don't steal. You know, pure thought, sexual purity issues, um, integrity issues. And I say, well, wait a minute. Hebrews 12, 4 said, you have not yet begun to shed blood in your striving against sin. So if I strive against all those sins, Leah. Those are internally and personal. They're all personal holiness sins. If I strive against all those sins, at what point will I begin to shed my blood? N- never. It's an absurd question. So I say to people, well. Unless you're Martin Luther and you well, start. Well, spl- obviously, yeah. the author of Hebrews is defining sin in a different way. What was the sin that the, that the prophets were striving against that caused their blood to be shed? Well, they were, which prophets? All the prophets that are referenced that they were killed. They were coming against Israel saying they that were you coming against the sin of their are society. either worshiping Baal or you're not obeying God. So they were, they were, basically, they were basically warning against the sin of society. Society. What was sin. Christ criti- crucified for? He took on the power basis. He took on the corruption. He took on, they killed him for it. So interposition is basically standing in the gap and taking on the sin of your society in oh, a persuasive that. way. Oh, that's Because you're so not good. imposing yourself. But here's, the, here's wow. the thing. The reason why they have to suppress you is because when you can basically make the moral apologetic to parents in a, in a, school, in a school district that they shouldn't allow pornography to be in their child's library. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, then you've suddenly be, been salt and light. Yeah. You've preserved and you've exposed. Yeah. And that's what they don't want. Right. So that's our core of our mission. Now, people say, well, then, well, there's all the kinds of people doing that kind of education. Right? I go, well, we're not education, we're service. And here's why. And this goes to the conversation you and I had. We look at it through a different lens. All kinds of people are saying, hey, get up into the podium and say this and go viral. All kinds of people are saying, hey, here's the latest article that you should be outraged about CRT. There's all kinds of education and awareness about what's wrong and why you should be outraged. Yeah. There's very little education on what to do about it. Mm. Is that fair? That's very fair. So for instance, these are just examples. When we train our teams, what we do is we form a core team in a community. We go in and we put them, we have very rigorous training that we put them through. We come in and we do a, strat- a strategic planning session for them and help them break, in, break things down into action about how they can accomplish their goals. We provide technology and support. We do, like, we're kind of a full service thing that we're helping with them with. But when, 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 we're, when we're training them, we're basically telling them this. It doesn't matter what Michelle thinks. It doesn't matter what Leah thinks, and it doesn't matter what Rick thinks, even if we're right. What matters is can Rick, Leah, and Michelle work together, and not only can we work and play well together, but can we work together in a way that makes the moral apologetic to the community to win them over? Yeah. If we're not holding ourselves accountable to that standard, we're not doing our, our role in salt and light. Yeah. And so, for instance, when we teach people to walk up and speak to their school board, one of the first things we train them on is, remember, Leah, when you speak to that school board, you're not speaking to the school board. Oh. They're going to ignore you. Okay. They're not going to answer your questions. Yeah. 
They're going to complete. They're gonna. They're gonna look snidely at you. Yeah. They're even gonna try to suppress you. Right. Right. When you talk to that school board, you're recruiting the room behind you. Oh, that's so good. You're and so we're just looking at it from a different lens, and we're teaching people how to do things. Everybody kind of, I hate to say it, but there's lots of logos and egos. People want to go up and they want to be the next viral video. And the problem is, with that is, is that that's about your kingdom, about your brand. What, what happens if I, what is it going to take for me to go up there and win the community over in a way that they don't look at Rick as the hero, but they see the moral the, apologetic. The moral they, argument. And now exactly. you're suddenly enraged and, and not, not refer- to do something. And I'm not referencing myself when I make the moral argument, am I? Who no. am I referencing when I make the moral argument? Well, God. Because he's the standard. You right? said something to me that many people are nervous to do anything in the public mm-hmm. because they know we're having a conversation and you're nodding and you're smiling and we kind of agree. Oh, yeah. That's a comfortable conversation. Oh. But when you're going in front of a school board, they are not nodding, they are not smiling, they are angry, and that is an uncomfortable conversation. So one of the first things we do when we train our teams, one of the first statements we make, we have a lot of slogans that we use, right? Yeah. You know, they're meant to like win either way strategy or, or um, always be the most reasonable voice in the room. And these slogans are there for a reason to keep changing your mindset and to train you, right? And one of the statements I make at the beginning of the class is, my job is to make you very comfortable with being very uncomfortable. I love that so much. Because think about this. You remember when Jesus said, you know, my, my burden is easy and my, my yoke is light and my burden is easy? Yeah. Well, there, if, if I'm going to take this bag and I'm going to carry it around yeah. and I'm out of shape yeah. and I'm weak, yeah. am I going to feel like that bag is easy no, and light? Right. But if I work my muscles and I get stronger, yeah. what Jesus was saying was, we always think about, well, what Jesus means is Jesus will do it all. Jesus is saying, no, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to equip you. you. I'm going I'm to fill you with my Holy Spirit to strengthen you. Yeah. But strengthening you still means you've got to lift the bag. Exactly. Okay? And so, you know, you can pray for the hole, but he still wants you to yeah. have a shovel. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> so the, the point here is, is that when we say our job is to make you comfortable being uncomfortable, we're trying to fulfill the fact that this will get easier and lighter, and you're going to be able to walk in there, and you're going to face opposition like Christ did, and it's going to bounce right off of you. Can you give some scenarios where maybe you've helped some people or heard some stories about people maybe you've kind of helped to get a backbone and to go oh, in yeah. and... So we've had, um, for instance, when we have, uh, like I said, we formed the core team and we train the core team. Then we try to basically build up volunteers and champion the core team. And then the volunteers influence the community, right? So we have like a three ring, by, but we spend all our time with the core team. Every once in a while, the core team will come to me and they'll be like, I don't really know how to prepare these parents for speaking in front of the school board could you do like a you know like a a zoom meeting or something to coach them so we do sometimes in person sometimes over zoom and one of the things i'll I'll say is okay when's the last time you spoke in front of school board never spoke in front of school board okay so here's your assignment for tonight your job is not to be like rick crump that can make the school board cringe your job tonight is just to get up there and emotionally hold yourself together in such a way that conveys your points in a professional way and and gets it on the record right now next time next month we're going to work on the next phase which is you made that point you thought about all the things you could have said afterwards right now let's work and coach on that right so next time you go and before you know it you've been up to the front of the school board four or five times and we've coached and mentored you in such a way that now you are on fire right you're no longer walking up to the microphone going yeah i would like to thank you for allowing me to speak tonight yeah 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 uh, at bequeathing you know yeah, allowing yeah, yeah, yeah. now you're walking up and you're saying hey you're still not listening. You're arrogant. And you're not representing us. You're representing the state capital and the, and the nation's capital, and you're not representing the constituents that put you in office. And now you have a boldness about you because we brought you along based on where you're at. Another example is you get on the school board. We talked about right. this yeah, one, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now you get on the school board, and you realize I'm the minority. Yeah. Yeah, but did you, under, did you ever stop to think about the fact that now you're the eyes and ears that can expose when they're in violation of, of, uh, of the Sunshine Act, as we call it in Pennsylvania, okay. where they have to basically, anything that's deliberations has to be public conversation. And they keep claiming that they keep having these deliberations in front of you. But did you ever notice that it seems awkward that you get in there and they're going to have two statements on something and take a vote? Well, where's all the deliberation? Well, you know where it was? They were having it behind closed doors illegally. But if you're the minority on the board, you can start to expose that now. Okay. Okay. Or you can begin to ask questions that no one's willing to ask because questions are where the power is. Yeah. So if we had, a, for instance, here's an example in the Oldie School District. Love my Oldie team. We we helped uh, three three board members get on the board there, 
And we just coach them the fact that your job is just to start asking the questions that no one else asks, slow the process down, and reveal the truth to the parents. The parents love it. They're grateful for it. Guess what happened? They were called bigots, racist. The LGB groups came out of the woodwork. Wow. So what do we do as Kinetic Faith? We train them. We coach them. We help them figure out how to handle it. Stay the course. Keep asking the questions. Ask, why am I being called a bigot just for asking a question? Yeah. Okay. We had them on our radio program. We revealed all this, right? Well, then we go on offense on their behalf. We call the LGB groups that we're calling them bigots and stuff. And we said, hey, would you like to come on our radio program and defend that? To this day, they don't take us up on it. Oh, I'm sorry, unavailable. Oh, I'm sorry, unavailable. Oh, I'm sorry, unavailable. Well, this is only about the 14th time I've called. Do you think you might tell me when she's going to be available? Because she's made a pretty outrageous accusation, and we would just like to give her the public platform by which she can defend it. Right. You, one of our slogans is always be on offense. Oh, that's now, so good. Now, what people misunderstand by that is that you're always being offensive. No. They're always going to call you offensive. Uh, by the way, the worst thing you can do is determine the correctness or incorrectness of what you said based on the other person's reaction. Oh, wow. Because if you do that, if, if, if the other person's reaction is an indication of your holiness, then Jesus Christ was the greatest sinner of all. Wow. Wow. Who yeah. did Jesus not offend? Yeah, exactly. Okay? Yeah. So you're basing it on the rightness and wrongness of what you're saying and you work on your delivery. Right. But again, your point is that you want to be persuasive to the right. crowd. Right. When Jesus Christ, here's an example of apologetics. When Jesus Christ went up to, um, th- this is a foundational truth about apologetics. When you take most apologetic courses, this is different than ours. When you take most apologetic courses, they say, here's some ways to answer and rebut statements or questions, right? They teach you these techniques and memorization. We teach you process. Here's apologetics as a process. Here's the premise of the argument. Here's the basis for the direction you want to go, how to play the movie forward in your head. And one of the points we make to them is the Gospels are one of the greatest foundational outlines of apologetics. Jesus always had three crowds when he was in the public square. He had his followers, which was his disciples. He had the detractors, which was the Pharisees and Sadducees. And he had the uh, inquisitors that were basically looking around saying, who should Hmm. we listen to? What did Jesus do? He looked at his disciples and he basically said, hold my beer and watch this. Right. Okay. He went up to the Pharisees and he took them on publicly. Right. Was he trying to persuade the Pharisees? No. No. In fact, in Colossians, it talks about basically he made a public spectacle of them. Do you know yeah. why? Because he was trying to teach the, those who were inquiring, you should listen to this truth, not that lie. Right. And so, was, so he was actually laying a blueprint. Boldly going up against the lie. Not trying to discuss. And, and I and, think that this is something where yeah. we as Christians really kind of trip up when we're when we're trying to do evangelism or intercession um but then you're dealing with some of these core moral issues and people in power um how do you how do you differentiate between the inquisitors and the pharisees great question so first of all let's run with the premise that jesus gave us a blueprint when I often talk about this in front of pastors or other people of authority, they will tell you, but that was Jesus. We're not supposed to do that. And I say, no, quite the opposite. Jesus was literally leaving us a blueprint for how to confront evil. I think he, How to interpose. Because he, he, he was interposing. Did he not come as man to show us how to That's live? Right. That's right. Now, people like to cite, oh, well, we're not supposed to pick up the scourge and beat people. I get that. But Jesus Christ always won the moral argument, and yeah. the crowds followed him in droves because of it. Okay. So let's work with that premise that it's a blueprint for us to follow. Now, how do you differentiate between somebody who's an inquirer and a Pharisee? Yeah. Very good question, because the last thing you want to do is treat an inquirer like a Pharisee. So what we teach you is basically you walk up and you start a conversation and you get people to tell on themselves. Oh. That's a technique. We train you on how to get you to tell on yourself. So we can get you to expose whether or not you're genuinely asking and confused and trying to understand versus you have an agenda and you've, veil- you've got veiled questions that you're trying to spin. Here's a great example. We were helping a school district once fight a, uh, a transgender policy that would have destroyed boys and girls' bathrooms, okay? In the midst of this, uh, this public uh, struggle, uh, after, a, after a particular board meeting one night, a young woman came up to our team and she says, I'm confused, I'm a Christian, I know you guys are trying to make the argument of what Jesus would want and, the, and to sustain and, and to support biological sex. She goes, but aren't we supposed to love people? Aren't we supposed to say that if, they, if, they're, if they're confused about this, why don't we accommodate them in love? Right. Now, the question going through my head at that moment is, is she an inquirer or is she a detractor? Now, if she was a school board member, I'd pretty much know the angle because we knew their, their agenda. 
But in this case, I just gently said to her something along the lines of, well, if, if I could use an analogy, if I walked into an insane asylum and a, and a man believed that he was Napoleon, would I be loving him by helping him continue that delusion of who he's not, or would I be helping him by remember who he is created in God's image? Right. And the minute I said that to her, she stopped. She's like, I never thought about it that way before. Yeah. And I thought, okay, you're an inquirer. You're genuinely asking. Right. You're not here to ask me a, a gotcha question to manipulate yeah, yeah, yeah. the situation. Yeah. There's, there's experience in this. We don't have enough to go into it today, but we can teach you in our training classes. But basically, you start off with these questions, and suddenly, if they're a Pharisee or a detractor, they'll tell them themselves. Well, that, yeah, but yeah, they're not here to ask. They're here to argue. So, so do you not... And we get caught up in these. We do. We get caught... Do we not, ha, do we not argue... Do we not? Do, what do you do when you're in that situation? So the Greek with word somebody? apologetic means yeah. to make a defense, an argument, and it means the word argument and defense. Okay, and so argument has been given a negative connotation, ironically, by the right itself, because we're supposed to be nice guys, I right? I know, I know. We, 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 Jesus we, wasn't we, nice. We do it to ourselves. Like, My oh, greatest fear is that you would introduce me as a nice guy. Don't ever. If you introduce me as a nice guy, I'll assume you don't like me. Okay. <laughs> I want to be a dangerous man for what's right. Okay. Okay. Now, now, that's just to confront evil, okay? I actually By love that. That is my, I am, this is exciting. This is. Do you know that we're commanded three times in the Bible to hate evil? It, it, we are. Most people don't know this. These are the things they're not being taught. Yeah. In, in, in Proverbs, in Psalms, in, in, we, are, we are told, in one point, the hating evil is equated with fearing God, and another it's equated with, um, with uh, loving God, and in another way, it's, in another verse, in Amos, I believe, it's, it's equated with... Uh, basically being able to qualify for God's mercy. Hate in other evil words, and love good. Yes. In other words, you have to hate evil yeah. if you want to have anything to do with God. Well, what happens when you hate evil? You basically are going to go try to destroy it. Right. So if there's pornography in my child's library and I turn a blind eye to it, is that hating evil? No. If I try to, no. Is that also is hating evil me going and, and stabbing or shooting or hurting the person putting it there? Why is no. it serpents harmless as doves? You, Correct. Strategic. Correct. You have to think, you think the end game. Right. The, so, uh, the, the end game is I want to get the pornography out of the school. Right. So let me, let me show you this. So here, here's another example. So we're all familiar with the bell curve, right? Yeah. This is not going far enough. This is going too far. Okay. Okay. On the right, we are so consumed with, with not going too far that we deliberately not go far enough. I think we kind of stay down here. And we morally justify it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then people get disillusioned. We and, don't even and, try it. And evil takes over, right? So what we say is this. If you think about a first stage of a relationship where, where things are going well, people are responding to uh -huh. you, it looks like this. Okay. This is far enough. Okay. I, I, I ask you, I get you on a phone call, I have a meeting with you, you're responsive to me, blah, blah, blah. But if, but if we're in this second stage of this relationship, that's not far enough because you're not listening to me. Okay. So we have to organize things to put you, put you under pressure, and now that's far enough. Okay. But then when that's not far enough, then this is what the relationship looks like. Okay. Basically, we have to go further with more pressure, okay. but in this relationship, it looks like it's too far. Okay. So basically, you have to evaluate where you are in the relationship with the people that represent you okay. and determine what's too far and what's far enough. And here's the key again. You have to get people to agree with you and cooperate with you. Right. So this isn't, again, about what Leah or Rick thinks. Right. This is what can Leah and Rick get others to cooperatively work with us on? Yeah. That's the essence of being salt and light. And can you name a single person in churches today that feels equipped to do that? Not very many. And, and, and yeah. I, so we do a lot of polling. When we, do, when we do public speaking, I have these polling questions up on the wall, okay? And we collect data everywhere we go. And one of the questions I'll ask is on a scale of 1 to 10, how equipped do you feel to, take on the, to lead change against the issues of, of evil in society today? Yeah. And on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the highest, it's typically 5 and below. And then I ask the question, and how long have you been in church? And most people say at least 20 years or more. Yeah. And I say, think about what you just said. I've been in church 20 years or more but I don't feel very equipped to take on evil in society. Right. There's something wrong. We need to have a yeah. different conversation in our yeah. churches. Because even if you want to argue the gospel, the gospel, the gospel, yeah. well, where are all these people doing the gospel? Yeah. Because they don't even have confidence anymore. They're not right. even evangelizing. Right. Because evil's taking over because they're not interposing. Well, they, you've that, been, you see how that all works you together? Kinda, so you go into churches and you've kind of been training. Do you train the pastors? Or do, you, <laughs> do you train the whole church? So only in the last eight months have we actually been able to get into churches. So we've been doing this, if, in August it'll be four years. Okay. And in the, four year, in the three and a half years, more than three and a half years that we've been doing this, the church has always closed the door on us. 
For instance, um, I, I started trying to teach this in the churches, got the doors closed. Uh, people asked for our help in the public square to fight some of these issues like drag queen story hour, transgender bathrooms, election integrity fraud issues. And so we helped forming teams to show them how to do this, right? Well, it was only after things got much worse that some of the pastors have been you know, willing to speak Yay. to us now, right? Well, so, at least so, they're some. Start, so they're starting. Our goal, our, 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 our mission at Kinetic Faith, the church is our mission field. Our mission is to get in and to equip the men in the church because that's who's missing, right? To get the men in the church to step up and to take over our role of yeah. interposition and training. So for instance, 90% of the people on our teams are women and 90% are Christians. And you know what they're all asking? Where's the church and where's the men? So what we want to do is we're, doing, we're, we're ramping up with, with John Diamond, Alan Keyes, and some others, and we're, we're, we're going to be holding a series of conferences with the church audiences being our target audience, and we want to basically tell them we should be the ones leading these, these fights in the public yeah. square, not fights that, you know what I mean, we, we should know. be leading the fight against evil, right? And so we want to get into these churches, and we want to train pastors and the lay leaders and the elders on these techniques we don't believe that the pastor should be the head of interposition because that's a distraction, just like in the book of Acts, right? But we do believe that a, a pastor of, of, um, of discipleship or a leader of men's ministry makes a great person to be coached and mentored to be the leader of an interposition ministry in our church. And we're there to support and help them. And that would be, what, what would be their steps once you've trained them to go out into the community and make real change? So remember the blueprint is the blueprint of the gospel. Six to eight people you spend a lot of time with, right? Jesus Christ spent three and a half years with 12 men and changed the world. So the goal is to train them on how to help lead teams. And then those teams influence volunteers in the community that influence the community at large, right? So we want these people to basically follow the same discipleship model because that's what it is, discipleship. Basically disciple people inside the church to be able to make the apologetic in the public square and train them and provide the support and resources they need to accomplish their mission. On, okay, so like, now, why would a church not want to do that? You're right. But the sticky part is that doctrinally, uh, whether you want to call it Marxism or Neo-Calvinism mm -hmm. or, I learned that, that was a new word somebody shared with me. Um, the, our theology's off. So it's how do you even go in to the churches and what, what are the specific targets that you guys, the big one in the church is abortion, abortion, abortion. Yep. But like, what are some of the other issues that you're, you you want to see people trained in to be able to take on? And how yeah. legitimately would you go beyond the school board? Where do you begin to a a attack so we begin, drag queen story we, hour? We begin with practicing what we preach. We go into the church and, and I'm going to make a kind of a, I'm going to make a very controversial statement. We believe it starts with bringing the church back to Christ. And so, that's not controversial for our show, but yeah, it might be for so, others. So we have to go in and practice what we preach by making them moral apologetic. Yeah. So for instance, one of the things we'll do is we'll, the first conversations we'll have with church leadership, and, and we, I call it the pew in the pulpit, right? The pew is very hungry for our message, but the pulpit is resistant. Hmm. But when I get them in the same room and I send this simple statement that the best indicator of whether you're being salt and light, salt preserves, light chases away darkness, is your community's tolerance for evil. Wow. I'm not talking about confessions of faith, conversions to Christ, baptisms. I'm talking about can you convince your community not to have pornography in their child's library? Right. That's the most, like the, the first rung on the ladder. That should be. And we say that look, if the church was doing its job in 1938 Germany, then Jews wouldn't have been on boxcars. Right. Because if they'd spent time talking about the moral imperative of why these are people and human beings created in the image of God and you right. should reject this this fascism. Right. But they didn't. They remained silent, right? right? So we, the first thing we do is we begin by making the moral apologetic inside the church right. about salt and light and about, about uh, the tolerance of evil. Then we show them that it's not just about the fact that you should care about it and, and be concerned about it, but you should be equipped, Ephesians 4, for the equipping of the saints for good works. And right. then we walk them through our methodology. And we basically say, no, look, you have no excuse. You know you should care, and you know that there's a way to do it. Do you want to do it or not? Right. And that's basically how we, we work with the churches. And, and I hate to say it, but we have what we call a front door, side door, back door strategy. The front door is a church is receptive. The leadership is receptive. They like, we understand the role of interposition. We don't really know how to do it all, but we need help. We want to go in and partner with them. That's the front door. The side door is the leadership is resistant, but the pew is receptive. And we're like, look, we're, we're not allowed to come teach us inside your church, but you can come to our seminars and, and stuff because we, we pay for things outside the church. And then the third is, 
You go back inside your church, that's your mission field. You're trying to convince people that we should care and love our neighbor through interposition. And if you finally just throw up your hands and go, this is a dead church, then we have a backdoor strategy which says, let us introduce you to a church that does care right. about their neighbor. Yeah. So that's that's how we work with the churches. And we, we, we by far prefer the front door approach. Yeah, we want sure. We want to work with pastors and elders but that, pastors that love But pastors are really afraid. You know, um, we held a Patriot Pastors event here in Ohio, and you're going to meet with Coach Dave. Coach Dave came, yep. he spoke. Um, Neil Peterson is running as an independent for governor in Ohio, and you all are going to vote for him. And he's um, a pastor. And he's a pastor. He's a pastor of a church. Um, we were able to get a lot of pastors together. Um, Lawrence uh, Bishop, Solid Rock here in Ohio, yep. is, a, is a, I, one of the largest churches, and he is, he is unapologetic in his apologetics. Um, and so he was. We had uh, Candace Keller. Uh, she helped get a heartbeat bill passed. She's an amazing Christian. Served in the House of Representatives. Um, but I did have some pastors ignore, and I did have some pastors say, again, we're just going to preach the gospel. We can't get involved in the patriot movement. We can't be involved in politics. So can I offer a couple things for the, for the audience to challenge their pastors with? Yeah. All right. So, again, we want to help you make the moral argument, right? I like to ask pastors, whose kingdom are we building? Mm. His kingdom or our kingdom? Yeah. If it's about butts in our chair, that's more about our kingdom than his kingdom. There's nothing about attendance rates that, that God's concerned about. He was concerned about is are we making a difference in our community? So if we have a packed house and there's pornography in our children's library and they're confused about their sexual identity and the divorce rate in our church is no different than outside in our public square and, and, and we've got Marxism knocking on the door and we've got children in our youth group confused, I don't think God's going to care about our 501c status and he's certainly not going to care about how many butts we have in the chair because we're totally irrelevant. Oh, yeah. Okay? So that's the first thing. I always challenge... Who are we, whose kingdom are we building? His kingdom or God's? Our kingdom or God's kingdom? The second thing is, we're all familiar with the verse that says, uh, you know, there will come a time when they will choose for themselves teachers who will tickle their ears, right? And it's easy at that point to pick on the pastor and go, oh, he's tickling their ears, he's tickling their ears. But remember what the first half of the verse said. There will come a time when we will choose for ourselves. Oh, wow. And so if you don't like what's coming across that pulpit because they're not willing to t stand in the gap and they're not willing to preach standing in the gap, then we own it in the pew. Just like we say that we own it in the public square, we have to own it in the pew. We have to take ownership and say, guys, this is on us. If there's, if there's tickling of the ears happening in the pulpit and we do nothing, all that's necessary for evil to succeed is for good, is good man to do nothing. Well, and then we, we always add to that, and how long can you do nothing and still call yourself a good man? Wow. That, that's so good. There's a, a big church here in this town and there is a, um, a Patriot liber uh, leader uh, who runs um, Friends, was it Friends United? Liber Friends United in Liberty um, here in the church that he was attending. They wouldn't allow his Patriot group, which was act an activist Patriot uh -huh. group. And it was, uh, he, he worked so hard. We got three, Milford, Ohio has three conservatives on the school board right now, this town that we're in, because of Bill Thomas. But his pastor told him, and his church told him they couldn't even meet in his church anymore. They also um, basically said, you know, we have too many liberals in our congregation. We can't even talk about abortion. Yeah. So here's how I, I, I say that. This represents the church. Okay? People are leaving churches. This is, by the way, this is data that we collect as part of our polling. So this yeah. is based on data. Yeah. This is the um, patriot and parent groups. Yeah. Okay, and we go speak at these patriot and parent groups and we recruit people to be our six to eight team members. This uh -huh. is what we call our community action team. Okay, okay. this is where I said that 90% are Christian yeah. and women. And yeah. they're asking, where's the church, where's the men? I know. They come from here and the polling data from here shows that 67% of the people attending these patriot and parent identify as conservative Christians. Yeah. Okay, only one third is our, our secular libertarians. And, and I asked them, when you think about the size of your church and you think about the people that are like you and are willing to take action, what do you represent? And it's 5%. Whoa. These people that feel this calling, like the abolitionists did, come from churches where they only feel like they identify with 5% of their congregation. Yeah. That's why this is our mission field. Now, I'll go yeah. back to your point. You asked me earlier about some examples. We've been helping uh, with school board teams for, for going on three years now. And to this day, we've called around several districts and several counties around Pennsylvania 
To this day, we have never, ever once had a church open their doors to allow us to hold a team meeting in their in their church. Wow. Ever. Wow. Ever. Wow. They're, oh, it's against policy. It's against policy, Leah. Well, Rick, you, you won't let me park in your driveway. You say it's against policy, but don't you and your wife make the policy? Yeah, but it's against policy, Leah. It's a circular argument. I'm talking to elders and pastors who make the policies, and they say it's against policy. And I say, well, when are you going to do we'll, we'll take that up. But our agenda is full for the next three elder board meetings, so we'll take it up three months from now. And then we'll kick the can down the road some more, hoping that you'll go away. And I say, you know, I, I literally use these examples when I teach my classes, is that in your district, I have called your churches, and none of them have said, you're welcome to use an empty meeting room in the middle of the day. I've even said, listen, we will take whatever you can get. If somebody walks in and says, we want this room, we'll pack up and leave. We will take, the, we will take a dark closet in the back corner of your, uh, of your, of your basement. Nope, 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 nope. I'm going to make a plug here because we're standing outside in like 90 degree weather. Thank you. Not because we couldn't find one pastor, but our one pastor that we have here in Milford, Ohio, is at church camp this week. And um, he is amazing pastor, Brian Shuttlesworth. He is at House of Reservations. If you're looking for a patriot pastor, we have one in Milford, Ohio. And we have one in Indiana. And Matthew Yellen's here, and he's plugging Chris. So we have one in Indiana, Gateway, Gateway and we have one in Dayton, Good. and that is Harvest Revival Neal's Church. And there are, there are some. There's actually a ton in Ohio. I can't eat more rooms yeah. in Ohio, just not in Milford. So let me um, say this. If, if you identify with this, if you've been one of these people that, that's fighting in your community, and you're part of some patriot or parent group, that, that identifies as conservative Christian, and, and you feel like you're the oddity or the, you know, what do we call it, the pork chop at the kosher wedding yeah. in your own church, right? If you feel like you're the odd person out, contact us. Yeah. That's why we're here. We, we want to equip you first and foremost to, to bring your church back to the mission of interposition and to equip and mobilize your own people. And then from there, take that to the public square where we can make a meaningful difference. No, one that's of the so things, good. One of the things we tell our teams all the time, Leah, is... They, people are afraid. They're going to get doxxed. They're going to get. They're going to yeah. get hated. They're yeah. going to get fired. Yeah. And I say, listen, one hundred percent. We can back this up with every team member we've ever had. One hundred percent of your initial resistance comes from the right. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. You can't do it. You're going to make things worse. Uh, that's unholy. Five hundred one c three. Five hundred one c three. Five hundred one c three. We have to train our teams how to break through the resistance on the right, so they can make the the war to the left. Right. And I say to them, the minute you get harassment from the left. The minute they, they show up, the LGBT crew, they bust people in, they, they harass you uh, at your business, turn to each other, high five, and say, praise God, because guess what you are? Blessed. You're now relevant. Oh, wow. Because until you're actually harassed by the left, you're irrelevant. Huh. Huh, there you go. The Bible says, bless are you were persecuted. Yeah, I want to give a, I want to give a shout out to Pastor Chris and Debbie Monaghan in Richmond, Indiana, who uh, just this, this time last year, around in April, um, they decided they needed to do something. So they started outside of their church a patriot group that meets once a month. And they have speakers in. And they're they started where? Yeah. Outside of their church. Well, they started outside to bring them in. Okay, so, that, that so, was the mission. God bless them. Then. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, so I, I was like, have, we no, got to no. get over this no, mission no, of people they bring leaving them in. the church. Okay, good. No, they bring Praise them in. God. Thank you for that. Thank you. That's leadership. Yeah, so the speakers that will come in, um, they'll because not everybody's a Christian and not everybody will come to a patriot group because you know if it's if you're yeah. if it's in a church. Yeah. So they bring in the speakers and then. Oftentimes, the speakers will again speak again, like we did on a Friday night where they had immersion nights. So, uh, Pastor Chris and Debbie are some of the only pastors and, and Pastor Neil Peterson that preach the, the topics at hand, the relevant people. Most people would actually actually come to your church if uh, you begin to preach on these topics that affect They're their everyday life. It. If yeah. they ever would like, I would love to speak at events like that. Everything yeah. we teach is biblical, and I can back it up with scripture. People in the pew are hungry for answers. They're desperately searching for answers. And my message to, to pastors today, and if you're, take this to your pastor, pastor, people need you to lead. Yeah. God wants you to lead. Yeah. The gates of hell are not supposed to be prevailing. Yeah. Your community's tolerance for evil is the best indication of what kind of a leader you are inside your church. I'm sorry, sir, but that's the case. Yeah. And, and, when, and when parents are coming to you and asking for answers and you can't provide them direction, or worse yet, they have to go outside your church to go yeah, find answers. Absolutely. What you're literally doing, sir, is you're sending people away from the church to find answers. Yes. That's horrifying. For, for, for right now. And, you know, I tell, we meet with a lot of patriot groups and I tell them, you're actually some of these people's minister. You're their shepherd. What does oh. a shepherd do? A shepherd 
keeps the wolves at, at bay. A shepherd takes takes on the lion, takes on the bear. And so these patriot leaders, they start with prayer. They're trying to bring the gospel in. And so God is actually kind of moving the definition of what is a minister, what is a yes. shepherd. Um, can I, what, can I what share is an illustration yeah. with you? So Hebrews 5.14. In the book of Hebrews, the, you've, uh, you've got this priest that Christ is being compared to. You've got this, this Jewish church that's basically falling back on its, on its uh, Judaism instead of faith in Christ, and they're being chastised for it. And in the book, of, in, the, in the fifth chapter, the author says that uh, you're basically still on milk and you should Absolutely. be eating solid food. Absolutely. But he says, solid food is for the mature right. who, because of practice, mm. have had their senses trained to discern good and evil. Yeah. So there's a lot to unpack there. So first of all, basically it's saying that, let's talk about the word practice. There's two Greek words for practice. There's praxis and hexis. Practice makes, means you take theory and put it into practice. Okay. Hexus means that you take theory and you put it into practice to the point of habit. Okay. The author is using the word hexus there. Okay. So solid food, which is the deeper teaching, is for the mature people. And how do you know if you're mature? Because you've been putting what you've learned into practice. You're not sitting yeah. and soaking. James says, you know, you, you, you're like the man that looks in the mirror and you turn around and walk away. People on the bench love to judge us who aren't in the game, Monday morning or, uh, armchair quarterbacks. Yeah. But I'm, my point to them is you don't understand good and evil. Go yeah. back to your point. The people that are in the arena out here interposing, yeah. they're on their knees more. They're yeah. studying their Bible more. They're yeah. learning good and bad and evil more. Yeah. They, under, they have a deeper, richer discernment of what's good and evil than people inside church. Absolutely. And the reason they do is because they've been putting their faith into... Action. Practice. Practice. They've yeah. been living it kinetically. Yeah. Kinetic That's the faith. point. That's the, why And that goes back to kinetic faith. So that actually was a perfect way to round this off um, with uh, Rick Crump from Kinetic Faith. So uh, how can people get in touch with you and get involved and, and begin to, to put these things into practice? Yeah. So um, we are based out of Reading, Pennsylvania, which is about 70 miles northwest of, uh, of Philadelphia. But we travel all around. We've never turned anybody down that needs our help. Um, you can go to kineticfaith.org, K-I-N-E-T-I-C, faith.org, and uh, learn more about how we, how we interact there. You can get on our contact list to receive updates of, of events that we have coming up. You can request that we come speak at your church or, or host an event for you. One of the things we do is we actually will host town hall meetings for people to, to help awesome. rally the community around them. Um, happy to come do training classes. Uh, would love to do a Zoom call and explain our methodology to people. So you can go to info at kineticfaith.org and email us there. You can go to kineticfaith.org, go to our contact page, sign up to receive updates. Um, there's also a, a phone number on there. You can, you can call to, uh, to talk to someone. Um, we, we, we just can't be more serious about the fact that we're called to get God's people off the bench. Finally, finally, you know, this has been a long, this is kind of what Michelle and I do on our show, um, is we try to bring, we, we say we don't lean right, we don't lean left, but we lean upon the word of God. And um, Candace uh, Keller, one of our favorite Ohio politicians, she has a jacket and says, um, everything is political and Jesus was an activist. Amen. Um, and so people, Those are don't, all true statements. people don't recognize that Jesus himself actually, he wasn't taking on the, re before we go, can you explain to people that, when Jesus was taking on the religious authority, he was taking on the political authority. Yes, yeah, so when, 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 the reason why Jesus Christ did not take on the Romans was because who, who, who did God ordain as the head of Israel? Their own, their own system of theology, right? right. The, the, the theocracy they had. Right. Now, we're not advocating for a theocracy. When, but yeah. when Jesus Christ took on the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Sanhedrin, he was basically taking on their government. Their government. And he was taking on their religious leaders, which were one and the same back in that day. So he took on the power structures everywhere he went. And he was, he was consumed with his father's house. He was consumed for justice. So Jesus Christ was, in, was, was confronting every form of evil imaginable in his day. The fact that they actually had demon-possessed people that could sit in their synagogues and without, without any discomfort shows you the state of their churches of that day. Yeah. But when Jesus Christ, with authority, walked into that same synagogue, the demons became very restless because they knew that there was a new standard that had just right. entered, God's standard, God, yeah. the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. And, and that's the kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent take up by force. You know, we talk about it all the time. The kingdom of God is advancing and we are part of that. So you guys, I want you to go to uh, Kinetic Faith. I want you to get involved um, and, and, and get trained because I know a lot of you, where do I start? What do I do? And so you don't have to be afraid that you can be bold and go, the righteous are as bold as the lion. So we love you. God loves you. And we'll see you later. Thank you.